This is John Moxley, a wrestler known mostly for his work in the WWE as Dean Ambrose. This photo was taken right after Moxley lost his first big match since leaving the WWE. I know it might not look like much, but this photo is a prime example of how great long-term storytelling can be. I'm Cody Mapson Lowe, and this is The Boardroom. Before we can even talk about long-term storytelling, we have to give a brief history of who this man is. Born in 1985 in Cincinnati, Ohio, John Moxley had a rough upbringing and used wrestling as an escape from his early life problems. When he was 18, Moxley began training to be a wrestler and by his early 20s, he was touring around America. Making a name for himself in promotions such as CZW and Dragon Gate USA, he was known for two distinct things, one of them being death matches. Death matches in wrestling are oftentimes unsettling. The aim is to use real blood, weapons, and high impact moves to inflict pain on both yourself and your opponent. This is then used to rile up bloodthirsty wrestling fans. While a portion of wrestling fans don't like these matches, they have carved their own niche, and in that niche, was John Moxley. The ability to put on great death matches was not what got Moxley a job in the WWE, it was actually his talking. Moxley was great at establishing a twisted character that had the tendencies of being a lunatic. He would do perverse things and use real life trauma to fuel his character. I just like that I'm just a sick guy. I'm really a really a dirty guy. A hot prospect, WWE signed him and kept the lunatic character but toned it down and gave him the new name of Dean Ambrose. He was being used in the feeder promotion known as FCW that later became NXT, WWE had an interesting idea to bring him onto the main television. Flanked by two other hot prospects in Seth Rollins and Roman Reigns, they debuted as The Shield. Dressed up in black bulletproof vests and saying they were fighting injustice, they became superstars in the company. Dean Ambrose specifically was seen as the leader as he was the best talker between the three of them. During their tenure, they became fan favorites and are considered one of the best wrestling groups of all time. All good things must come to an end, however, as they split up in 2014, only two years after debuting. Ambrose went on to have amazing storylines with Seth Rollins and Triple H being pushed as the lunatic fringe, an unhinged yet oddly funny and relatable fan favorite. The benefits of long-term storytelling week by week, year by year, is that the WWE uses it as a way to constantly flesh out characters. Rather than having a big TV cliffhanger happen and then you have to find out the resolution the next season, WWE resolves it within a week. And Ambrose was a perfect example who would come up with little quirks and motivations that really boosted his character, such as his intense hatred for Seth Rollins or his random callbacks to 80s wrestling. The Mountie always gets his man. In 2016, his hard work paid off as he won the WWE World Championship, fulfilling a lifelong dream. After a while though, things started winding down. An injury in 2017 kept him out of action for half a year. When he came back, none of his storylines were interesting. To try and spice up Ambrose's character, they turned him into a bad guy or a heel, as it's known in the wrestling business. But his run as a heel was uneventful. The WWE wrote nothing great for him, including one segment where he got vaccinations. It was supposed to be funny and wacky, but it just came across as weird. Which is one of the main criticisms of WWE's writing, because they rely on long-term storytelling, but recently have struggled. Having a boss in Vince McMahon who doesn't understand younger pop culture must be hard. Seriously, McMahon is a really weird dude and I might have to do a solo episode on him sometime in the future. But there is also a writing department that is constantly swapped in and out, and they heavily script segments for wrestlers. Yet, someone like Ambrose doesn't need that. He's an intelligent and creative person that can do wonders with the microphone. In early 2019, rumors came out that Ambrose was not re-signing with the WWE and letting his contract expire, with many thinking he was retiring. Ambrose later stated that he was frustrated with the WWE creative process, and he felt his character was irreparably damaged. So with growing frustrations, it seemed that Dean Ambrose was going to ride off into the sunset never to be seen again until John Moxley came back onto the wrestling scene. Signing with new promotion All Elite Wrestling, Moxley debuted unannounced shortly after leaving the WWE. Moxley all of a sudden became the talk of wrestling. And he also joined New Japan Pro Wrestling, the top wrestling company in Japan and considered by many wrestling fans as the best company in the world. Before we can get into that, let's talk about John Moxley's character. Moxley isn't the deranged character he once was. He is also not the watered down version that he was in the WWE. 
It's an in-between. This character has an air of believability to him that wasn't captured in the WWE. Anytime he tells a joke, it actually lands with the audience. His debut in New Japan Pro Wrestling was well received as he won the IWGP United States Championship in his first match to Juice Robinson. Robinson is a former WWE wrestler that's had way better success after leaving the WWE. I'm starting to see a bit of a pattern here. This match began a great storyline for John Moxley. After winning the title, he took young Japanese wrestler Shota Omono under his wing. This relationship had a funny aspect, considering that Moxley does not speak Japanese, oftentimes calling Shota Shuda, and Shota barely speaks English himself. And then he entered the G1 Climax, one of the biggest wrestling events in the world. The G1 Climax happens once every year and is made up of 20 wrestlers split into groups of 10. The person with the most wins of the group after taking on all nine of their opponents faces the winner of the other group. The winner of that match is given the title match at Wrestle Kingdom, the equivalent of Japan's WrestleMania. Moxley won his first five matches against Taichi, Jeff Cobb, Tomohiro Ishii, Shingo Takaki, and one of the best wrestlers in New Japan Pro Wrestling, Tetsuo Naito. All serious competitors that have had various degrees of success. So the story was that Moxley can't be beat. He's just too good for any Japanese wrestler and that the sports entertainment wrestler will beat anyone. Then this match happened. His opponent was Toriyano, somewhat the opposite of John Moxley's character. Toriyano is a comedic character that uses cheating tactics to win. He often brings self-help DVDs to the ring that he then tries and sells to his opponents or fans. So, all wrestling fans thought that Moxley would win the match and continue on. Wrong. You see, Toriano has been used as a plot device in the G1 before. Anytime a wrestler needs a loss that isn't going to affect or hinder the character, you use Yano to win. Or if a wrestler needs a win, you use Yano to lose. It fits his character no matter what. This match was a short affair with a pretty cool turnbuckle duel. They go to the outside where Moxley uses a table as a headrest for Yano. As Moxley goes to hit Yano, Yano pulls in Moxley's manager Shota and then Yano low blows the both of them. He then uses tape and tapes Moxley and Shota together as Yano runs back into the ring. In wrestling, there's a thing called count out. Basically, if you're out of the ring for too long, the referee starts counting to 10 or 20. Out for too long and you lose. It's a storytelling mechanism to ensure that characters stay in the ring. So Moxley doesn't make it to the ring and loses by count out. This face here is the realization that his undefeated streak ends not by going out on his sword like the character would prefer, but by tactics he couldn't best. Moxley would then lose his next three matches against Jay White, Hiroko Goto, and Juice Robinson. Another good example of long-term storytelling. Moxley still had a chance to win in his group and go to the final, but the person standing in his way was the first wrestler he beat in New Japan Pro Wrestling, Juice Robinson. So when Juice wins, it makes it all the more poetic and allows for the storyline to keep going while not just having them wrestle each other every single week. Where does John Moxley go from here? Well, he's still wrestling in Japan and soon to be back in America with AEW, but he right now is the commander of his own destiny. Moxley has done something incredible. All in a matter of months, he's gone from being a stale character to one of the best in the world without changing much about him. In wrestling for that to happen, you need to do a complete character overhaul and change who you are. And all of that requires great long-term storytelling. And Moxley has been able to turn all the short stories into the bigger picture of his story. And the good thing is, is that there really is no end. The story keeps going until a wrestler retires. So the story from Moxley may go on for years, maybe even decades, which is good for wrestling fans around the world. That's it for The Boardroom. I'm Cody Maps and Lowe. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.